morning, everybody, and welcome to Hometown Cable. Uh, another Sunday, another story, but still the old program. What's going on here? I'm Bob Venn, Calvin Castine, and we we continue to move around. Person to my right's name is Pat Curran, but before I, we talk to him, I want to tell you, yesterday we were at uh, Castine's auction uh, along the lake, and today we're deep in the woods, uh, in behind uh, Moore's Forks area, and we're here to see logging operations and uh, chipping and so forth. And you're going to, I think, really enjoy what you're going to see today. Uh, I have not seen this, but I'm familiar with the process. And uh, we're here to talk with Pat Curran. Pat, good morning. Good day. And thank you for uh, consenting to show us around in the woods. Uh, I guess this came about because of Leonard Brown. Is that correct? Uh, yes. And yeah. we're on Leonard's property. That's right. Up behind Cannon's Corners, and uh, where are you from, Pat? I'm from Messina, New York. You have a name for your company? Seaway Timber Harvesting is the main chipping company, and Curran Logging is the original company that we first started with. Wow, that's a big name. What's all that about? What do you do? Basically, we our main market is supplying paper mills with clean chips, and also we're heavy into the saw logs also up into marketing in Canada. So. You sell logs also? Yes, we do. All right. A lot of people out there don't know what we're talking about at all, I'm sure. To make paper, you need uh, wood. That's right. right. Hardwood or softwood. That's right. Uh, the normal paper that you read every day is made with a more of a softwood, and you get a, you get a bigger yield out of uh, a given, uh, I think they call it a cubit? Is that, is that what you're, well, it depends what you're, on where you're from. Okay. Yes. All over the place, they have different ways of measuring their their fiber. When we're selling our wood here, it's sold in the to the Canadian markets by the oven dry metric ton. The U.S. markets, it's sold by the U.S. short green ton, which means there's more moisture in it. You're paying for the moisture. It's That's really right. heavier. So what we're trying to get is you can sell wood to the to the plant in big logs like this or uh, smaller logs that they float down the river. That's awfully big for selling to a mill, I think. These, huh? are, these logs that you're looking at right now are saw logs. They'll be oh, taken for, into Canada. For boards? Yes. All right. But you usually, you've got a, they make them in eight foot links. They, they shove them down the river. At least they used to go down the river. Can you still go down the river? No, uh, <laughs> not, not in this area. And as far as I know, the last log drive and and this area is being held up above Three Rivers, Quebec, and that, that's going to be over this year. Okay. So they can take the logs and bring them to the plant. The plant piles them up, and they bring them inside. They put them through a chipper where you get all little tiny pieces. Uh, here's one right here. That's a chip. And, and, that would, uh, and they can do that in the mill or, and I've never seen it out into the, in the woods like this, where they can do this right here in the woods and you bring it by dump trucks or large areas that... Large chip vans. Okay. Now, that, just to give you an idea, you do both of those operations. You sell logs and you sell chips. Yes. Okay. What are we going to see today? You're going to see a Moorbark flail chipper. The flail meaning there's, there's two drums in this machine that have chain spinning at a high speed and that chain hits the wood knocks the bark and the twigs off that goes out a separate conveyor which goes back on the land and the clean part of the tree which would be the mainly the bull stem is on its way through the chipper we cannot sell wood to the paper markets with all the bark on and with these machines here it's allowed us to to get into the paper industry and Nothing is very secure yet. We've got to sell our wood to four different markets to try to keep our, our equipment going. But uh, we think in the long run it's going okay. to gonna be pretty good. How long have you been in this business? I've been in since I was 17. But it, it really didn't look like this when we first got going. It started with a one-ton truck and some chainsaws. Your own company? You didn't work for somebody else, no. correct? Was your father in this business? My father helped us out quite a bit, you know, at different times. But as far as actually being in the business uh, at the at the rate that it is now, no, he never was. Okay, you said we. That means it's more than you. Yes. And not your employees. You got brothers, family in this? Yes. Myself, Tim, and Lee are all owners of Seaway Timber Harvesting. And Current Logging is owned by Tim and myself. Okay. And... Uh, 
Current harvest. What's the second one you said? Current logging. Okay, now that's where you get the logs instead of the chipping. No, well, they both both companies work together. Okay. You know, and basically what it was was current logging was first. That was a company formed in 1984, and then in 1990 is when I bought out a Canadian company and created Seaway Timber Harvest. Okay. Now you realize you put me on the spot. You see, when I asked you how long you've been in, you said since you were 17. Now when I ask you how long that was, you're going to tell me your age. You realize that. <laughs> see, without even knowing it. <clears throat> well, it, when they get figured and everything out, I still got an alibi. Here. But there was, there was a period in there where I was just struggling like most people do in business to, to make one end rub against the other to, to get a few bucks. And then finally we got enough equipment and ahead where we had to hire men and that's when we okay. we became a company. When I <coughs> talk about <coughs> excuse me, regular logging, I mean the guy goes in, cuts a tree, puts it into eight foot lengths or something. <coughs> when did you get involved where you got in did you start that way where you just no, no. never did that? No, we we started handling Big. No, no, we started no. very small. Okay. We were handling uh pulpwood by hand, throwing it on a doodle bug, bringing it out, throwing it on a one-ton truck, going to the mill, throwing it off into the the conveyor or the the hole where the cranes would pick it out. So now, normally, in histor is history historically wise, they used to cut wood mostly in the winter. Well, right? and then you float them down the river in the spring. Is that correct? Yes, that is. But do you do that anymore? No, we cut year-round. You cut year round. You get yes. up with I can here in the winter. Yes, and what we try to do is, winter time is your best time of the year. If you can freeze the roads, you know okay, you can yeah. really go. <clears throat> but the the amount of equipment we have and the men that we have working for us, we try to schedule things so we have the right sites where we can work year round. And okay. we may lose anywhere from three to four weeks a year where the weather is just plain too bad and and we just can't can't work. Okay. Three Brothers Company, how many do you hire in that company? Well, between the two companies, we have 35 employees. 35, yeah. Do you buy any logs independently from anybody who cut them for themselves? Sometimes <clears> we <throat> do, but the problem is it costs so much to set up this operation. It has to be a pretty good sized contractor, and he needs to have at least 50 loads up before it's worthwhile. Okay. And how long have you been in this area? We've been. This job. We've been on this job now, we're on the fourth week. Fourth week, that's all. Yeah. And how long will you be here, you figure? Well, we'll be on Leonard's piece probably throughout this week. And then we bought some more timber from adjoining landowners. So we'll probably be here, I'd say, uh, well into the middle of May. Okay. Middle of May? Well, that's going to be a really a short job. Well, it is, but the amount of volume that we you move... You can do an awful lot of you, stuff, huh? You can cover a lot of ground in a hurry. Yeah. How long, well, have you already got your next job picked out? Yes. Where you gonna, you, you do have that. Yes. All right, we'll be right back. We're talking with Pat Curran at C-U-R-R-A-N. Yes. And uh, we'll be right back. We're up in the back of Moore's Forks. And uh, you were telling us on the way up how good the roads are for this time of the year, right? Oh, yes. They were this, rough, but very good. This is an exceptional spring. You like this? Yes, I would take this every year. You're going to make so much money this year, you're going to retire next year completely for one year. I like your idea, but you're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> What do we have here, Pat? What we have here is a 748 John Deere grapple skitter. And this machine is used to, to go back in where the feller bunchers are cutting and grab the, the timber hydraulically that's put in piles for it, bring it onto the chipper. Wow. We have, between the two jobs, we're running eight 748s. You run eight of these? Yes. Well, I guess a good time. What's a, what's a retail round ball, ball, ballpark figure on a machine like that? if you buy it. Well, this machine is a 1994 and uh, we paid 152000 for that machine. Well, the uh, Calvin said he's going to have to wash it off. You realize that when he's in the mud, right up to probably a foot deep or so, and those chains just throw that mud right up there, doesn't That's it? Right. Huh? And it's probably moving pretty quick, too. Yes. It's not just, yep. uh, you can't throw mud unless you're moving uh, something like that. First of all, John Deere is supposed to be green, Pat. 
what's happening with this yellow color? Well, you're you're too used to the the lawn tractor and snowblower industry. Oh, and the farm, the farm yeah, tractor. Okay. okay. Well, anyway, industrial color is yellow. All right. John Deere's industrial. All all companies, I guess, are yellow. Huh? Yes. Industrial. And okay. this this machine that you see in the background right here, this is a Caterpillar, and this machine is on demo from Caterpillar. They would probably get a little bit uptight because this machine hasn't been released yet for the market, seeing that this is on camera. But I don't think they're going to get too upset over here at Morris. Okay, now, what, why is that better? Or what? There's another one over there. That's a John Deere, very similar. No, they're they're trying to. They're they're bringing this machine on our job mainly for comparison. And of course, Caterpillar would like to to have us eventually maybe purchasing their skidders to skid the wood with. Uh huh. And it's a it's a very nice machine. It's a little smaller in size than our 748. Wow. Now this is where they're pushing with the front end, the piling it so they can grab it with the other end? Yes. They, he's pushing that close to the chipper and when a, when a chip truck will come, there's a loader mounted on that chipper and the operator will feed the trees through the rear of that machine. All right, look that, at the claws. Excuse me. Uh, what, I want, we may see that again, but no. Look at that thing turn. Okay, what he's doing with this material here, this is the bark and twigs that that comes off the trees that we can't uh, include it with our chips for the paper industry. Right. So you you do that first as a debarker here? Yes. Okay. It's all in one process going through the chipper. But that material, what he's taking back, he'll be dropping that in the woods in front of his next hitch or if there's a bad spot in the skid halt and basically utilizing it there. Amazing. Uh, do you go home every night, Messina? Yes. So what time did your operation get started in the morning? Okay, this operation usually gets rolling around 6.30 in the morning. In the morning? Yes, and on this particular job, Tim is running this job. I'm not on the site all the time. Uh -huh. That's Tim over there, by the way, over next to the, the uh, just going into the other truck. We'll see him later. Yes. All right. So you're here to see us this morning? That's right. You're working at another job up in Merrill? Is that no, you're actually, in? I'm all over the place. You're all over the place. Yes trying to line up more timber uh -huh. and trying to ensure that the market is here. Do, uh, do these people work for you on an hourly or a job basis or do they get uh, based on production or how do they work? Everybody gets paid by the hour. By the hour, all right. Are they all from our northern area here, Messina area? Your people? Every, everybody except for some of the truck drivers are out of Ontario and there is one fellow on the other job that's out of Ontario. Mostly Canadians here, huh? No, no. No. Oh, I beg your pardon. Everybody is, is, is from upstate New York. Oh, okay. I beg, your I, I beg your pardon. I beg your pardon. I beg your pardon. It's understood that. All right. So this one here is, when you bring that log here, that tree, you got everything on it. You just cut it and everything comes with it. That's right. Till you get to this point. All right. And what you're looking at here for timber is a lot of low-grade timber, which uh, as far as, you know, a conventional operation cutting pulpwood, it's just basically too small and but with the, the automated system that we have, we can utilize this material. So you will chop up those smaller six inch in diameter or yes. five inch in diameter, yes, you'll do that will. too, right? And they'll also be debarked. Okay. Well, we see two big red machines there, red, orange, but we'll talk about those later, I think, rather than get into it now. Uh, we saw this big machine here. This big machine, it does the same thing as that small machine does, only the bigger, bigger that's, trees? That that's basically? right. What we're talking no, about. no, it's not bigger trees, it's less volume. You know, the, the big thing here is if your machine is big enough, you can pull a, you know, more weight in your hitch. But if your machine isn't that big, you've got to cut your load down. So. Okay. Now, when they spread that out in the woods, do they kind of spread it? They don't put it in a pile somewhere. They'll just <laughs> open their arm gradually and it'll kind of... Kind of, so that it'll, it'll just be eaten up and become a part of the vegetation yeah. again, huh? Here comes a... A chip truck back from his first trip to the mill. Okay, now we don't, you won't see some pictures, we'll talk about that later. It's very interesting the way that truck is unloaded when it gets to the mill. I was uh, amazed when I saw it. 
Uh, that's your name right there. Yeah. Seaway Timber Harvesting. Yeah, that's uh, this truck that's pulling that trailer is a hired truck which belongs to Bruce Round Point construction on Cornwall Island. And the tractor, uh, the trailer is yours? Yes. I own, our company owns all the trailers. How many would you have? We have 13 trailers right now and eight trucks of our own and five hired trucks. Amazing. You're, you've really grown in the six years you've been in since you were 18. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty good. Like that. <laughs> you like that, Pat. Uh, just gives you an idea, folks, that when you go by an area, you're in a little country road back here, you'd have no idea what's going on three, four miles in. And this, I had no idea that this was going on in our, in our area whatsoever. And I thought I knew what was happening a little bit. Uh, Calvin uh, sees a lot of people. We hear a lot of things. And of course, we're always interested to bring you a, uh, the story and on what's going on here as to just what is going on and what's happening and uh, this is a very very interesting day we're starting out we'll be right back you're watching hometown cable thank you much for tuning in and don't forget uh, we're out every day at uh, 12 30 4 15 8 o'clock midnight and 8 the following morning five shows of the same thing uh, what's going on here is only on on Sundays and we're always pleased to hear your comment that's a look Rick Now we're watching this uh, uh, operation. The truck just came in with the trailer, and this whole machine does everything. Yes, it does. Okay, you, I'll leave it up to you, Pat. Here, whenever you want to say something, go right ahead. This is a model 2455 flail chip harvester built by Moorvark Industries out of Michigan. And what it does is, first of all, uh, when he puts a tree in, within the first six feet of the the what appears to be the chipper is where the flail is sitting. And that has two flail drums loaded with chain. And you can hear the chain right now hitting the tree. Taking the bark off. That takes the bark off. And then with the, as you look at the chipper, now you can see the chips going through. Yeah, the other yeah. look at that thing, how fast it's going through. And that's going to be cut into pieces the size that you just saw me handle. It's absolutely amazing. What kind of a horsepower runs that? Well, on the front part that does the chipping and runs the, the loader, you have an 800 horse cat. And in the center, there's a 350 horse cat that does the, the flailing, which is the debarking. When you bring that... There, if you look at that piece right there, there's a piece that... Uh, that's what it looks like after going through the debarker. That was backed out on, say, the last okay. load. All right. Now, there's only one operator operating that whole thing. That's right. And there he is up there. There's always a man on the ground, though, on the other side watching because you never know what can go wrong with that machine. True. Now, would he be, I don't want to say your most experienced, but he's got to be, uh, well, I, I don't, what's the word I want for that operator? He's got to be your main man, one of your main men? Yes, he is. Uh, actually, everybody on this site is, as far as I'm concerned, is a main, I main did, person. I did, I'm not using the right words, but uh, that's... There, it takes a lot of talent and a lot of ability to run that machine, yes. I would think so. <laughs> Look at that thing feed in through there. So it, it'll it chip the little tiny br uh, branches too? Yes, it will. Okay. And what you see coming out this conveyor is the bark and twigs that uh, is beat off the tree, which helps uh, the grade of the, the product we're selling. Now, is that chute throwing that in there far, all the way to the front of that? trailer? Yes, it will. It'll fill a trailer from the, the front right to the rear. Now, do they keep diverting that? Is there someone to aid that at all? No, that that machine has enough power and the way that the, the paddles that throw the chips are designed that you can basically put it in one spot and it'll fill a trailer. Can you vary the size of the chip? Yes, you can, but it's not as easy as you'd think because it's all, you'd have to reship the machine to do it. Okay. But our market calls mainly for a three-quarter to seven-eighths inch chip, and that's what we're set for. Okay. When we get uh, a little bit later on, I'll try to explain to you with the help of Pat the difference between uh, chips 
and normal wood, which is ground many times. It, I think uh, most of the work they're doing now at uh, Dom Tar in uh, Cornwall is mostly chips, isn't it? That, yes, but they're still buying a considerable amount of pulp wood and debarking and chipping their they're own. Chipping, but they, at the final production, is all chips. Yes, it is. It, it has okay. to that's all they're doing in that particular plant. So, but look, look at the, uh, now, what, do you rather use bigger bigger trees or smaller trees? Well, actually, the bigger the tree, the better the quality you're gonna get. Uh-huh. And you, you don't have to, there's more, more good fiber in a big tree than there is in a small one. When you uh, go into the woods and someone's gonna cut this down, have you gone ahead and cut the tree you want to cut? Have you marked it some way so they know, or do they well, pick it out themselves? On on most sites, uh, the trees are either marked or they're by a species cut. And then we do get onto the odd site where we're actually clearing land, or for one reason or another, a landowner may want to cut hard. So there's one big hole where that's going in. What's yeah. the diameter where that can be fed? Well, in? that's 40 inches wide going in the back by 27 inches high <laughs> but it you can't put a tree in that big because the hole shrinks on the way through the, the chipper as it's going through it being debarked how much of an area is it being debarked how much is how long is that area the area in the debarking chamber is, is right in the 14 foot range 14 foot long okay yeah. But the actual chamber from where the tree starts to where it hits the chipper is about 22 feet say that again the actual chamber from where the tree starts in the rear of the chipper before it hits the chipper is about 22 okay. feet. My first thought, Pat, in addition to how remarkably this is, remarkable, is uh, breakdown. you got so many parts there that can have a problem. Yes. Do you get much breakdown? We have uh, quite a lot of problems, but we have a good maintenance program and we try to try to keep up with everything as it goes. Yeah, I suppose you take uh, measures before things happen, you replace before they break down? Yes, you do. Because when that's down, you, that's, <laughs> yeah. there's well, a lot of money being lost. One thing about it, the chipper, our market is so tough on quality of chips that it, it isn't something that you can just let it run down and run down. You've got to constantly be working on the machine daily. Okay. As you look at the trailer, you'll notice the, the front window is is already full. Oh, okay, yes, you do a little window up, up above. I do see that, yes. Okay. I see some of the people running around have uh, ear guards, huh? Yes, it's, uh, it's a policy we have, and it's also a regulation with OSHA. Uh -huh. Either you wear ear guards, over your earmuffs, over your ears, or earplugs. Well, that's your older brother, Tib. Well, he's he's not much older. Well, I didn't say that. He's older brother, Tib, though. If he's a year, he's older. Okay. Is that yes. all right? Yes. Okay. That's, that's the other part. And your third brother, you said, is? Lee. Lee. Yeah. Okay. I also have five other brothers. And at times, there's been as many as six of us working together. How many in the family? Well, there's, there's eight brothers. Eight sons and my my parents. They're all boys? Yes. Well, I'll tell you, uh, your wife must have been welcome in your house when you went home for a holiday. I'm sure. <laughs> yes. Uh, were you raised in Messina? Yes, we were. Well, just outside of Messina in a little town called Louisville. Louisville. Wow. And in fact, that's where all of us still live. Uh -huh. What do your other brothers do now? Are they in the business at all? I have one brother, Mark, which is running the, the chip site on the other job, and Lee, which is an owner, he's doing a lot of everything. He can be at any specific time, any day, depending on who's missing and, and where we need him. And the other four brothers are not in the wood business? No. Uh, you don't have to tell us where, but they're not in the wood business. No, they're not. Okay. Uh, there's got to be a boss. We've well, got to be a boss on the floor. Yes, we... Uh, take turns? No, it, it's not that. <laughs> Basically, we, Tim and Lee and myself, have our our meetings together, and we try to get a direction on where we're going. And the main thing is uh, 
try to get along and at the same time try to keep the production going. It's, it's great, great after. How long does it take normally to fill up a half an hour to fill up a trailer like that? Yes, in, in decent timber that's what it takes, is about if, a half hour. If you had bigger ones like that it would fill quicker probably. Yes, but not a lot different. Not that much different, no. huh? Alright. Really what uh, if if you have the wood right at the rear of the chipper, that's what really takes your uh, your time down on the chipping. When you move that piece of equipment from down here to another location, does it go out in all one piece like that? All one piece. We've never seen one of those on a highway. It must be very difficult to turn it into a place like this. No, actually, uh, when you think about it, it's set up exactly like your chip trailer, but it's a uh, in a little different configuration. Look at the power on that up there. That machine over there will be pulling a saw log out of that tree. Will be what? And we'll be pulling a saw log out of that tree. Oh, you're okay. You're yeah. going to save that for uh, for lumber. Yes, that's one thing we try to do is never never chip anything that would make uh, a valuable piece of lumber. Right, but that's worth more, obviously. Yes. Uh, what what uh, diameter do you work from, up or down? Well, this machine you can put in is anywhere from, say, a three-inch tree, which really there isn't a lot of utilization to, on up to, say, 24 inches. Okay, my question was bad. If you were going to save for lumber, what size would you want to be your minimum size? Down to 10 inches. 10 inches. And we got another trailer coming in right here. It's going to be backing up right in front of us. Yes. Lots of production right here. Now, were these trees that they're that they're putting through it up cut this morning? Well, some of them might be, but usually the feller bunchers are two to three days ahead of the chipper. Okay. Or the skitters, rather. And they're going to run out pretty quick right here on that one. Yes, but the. They have, again. they have quite a lot of wood stockpiled behind the chippers here, and when they see that the... Uh, oh, further back. Yes. Oh, they, yeah, it's coming up somewhere right now. When they talk about a skitter, there it is right there doing its job. Look at that. Amazing. What kind of experience do your men have? How many years have they been with you? Well, we have a very small turnover in men, and we've got people that have been in the business as long as uh, 20 years from the company that we we purchased in Canada on until people that, that we've had work with us. Now this is a smaller version of what we just saw? Well it's an older version. Not smaller, that's, older. That's right, it'll do the same job. Uh -huh. How many of those do you have? Go, go we on. have three. three of them. Basically uh, most of the time, you'll we'll just use one on each job, but we happen to have the spare chipper on this job right now. And uh -huh. uh, what's the age of this one? Well, it looks old, but that machine is two and a half years old. That's all. Yes, and the other machine that you were looking at prior to this was new in August. Oh, amazing! Now let's talk about uh, longevity. How long would that be good for, generally? Well, it comes right down to what I told you earlier. It's not a machine that you can let it run down, so you always have to keep it up. And you can have a machine that, like we have on the other job, which is four years old, which is in as good a shape as the new machine. All right, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you then. All right, we'll take a short break here, and we'll be going right back. We're in the woods uh, behind Cannon's Corners, and we're seeing the one of the big logging operations, getting chips for Domtar and other paper mills. Others too. There's so much going on here this morning in this <clears throat> little clearing in the woods. Uh, we see a truck coming in now with fuel. Uh, it says Don's Fuel is already one of his trucks here. Does he leave his truck here? Yes. He take it and leave it when you, when you empty it? There's a truck. Both of those trucks are on site. One has highway fuel and one has off road fuel. You must use an awful lot of fuel out here. Yes, we do. All right, my question was, <clears throat> you got one machine here two and a half years old, you got another machine six months old, and you got one other one. If they last a long time, what did you do before these three? Because if, uh, did some others wear out on you? We, we first got involved in chipping in 1990 when we bought out, which was a former Chenier and Cloutier chipping in Cornwall, Ontario. 
At that time, they had a, a chipping operation that the mill would accept dirty chips, which bark, twigs, everything went in. But part of the agreement when we got into it, we had to find a way to come up with a clean chip. And at the same time, more bark was looking to get into the industry. And we bought more bark's very first whale chipper. <coughs> These two skitters I see, do they stay in the clearing most of the time? Well, depends on on the situation. Like right now, there's there's demand for the wood behind the, the chipper, so the, the skitters all have radios in them, so they're passing word on, and, and one or two operators will pull from the stockpile, which is shortly behind the chipper. So then the other skitters will bring them from where they are to here? Yes, they will. All right. Uh, uh, ballpark figure, August 1994. What's a machine like that run? Well, it's not ballpark. The actual dollars is 450,000 U.S. That's a lot of money to put out all at one time. I didn't put it out. <laughs> you didn't, huh? No. no. <laughs> uh, do you rent that or do you own it? We we're buying the machine. It's financed. Okay, so it's a finance type of thing. Yes. Huh? Just think of the interest on 450,000 uh, dollars every month. You pay monthly on the payments. Yes, and we so do. Forth. So it's not all profit, you're telling me. No, very little profit. <laughs> oh, yeah. yes, 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 yes. Okay. It's, a, it's a very high capital business. You know, with the chippers, the feller bunchers, the trucks, trailers, maintenance. And it, there's a lot to keep it going. I mean, it looks very glamorous looking at it here today, but you got to really keep on top of it just to stay in business. All right, Pat, are you married? Yes, I am. How many children do you have? I have three daughters. Have three, three daughters? Yes. Well, they've got a lot of help in the business. What's their ages? My oldest is 16, and I've got a nine-year-old and a four-year-old. Okay, so they don't come out and help that much here then. No, actually, uh, I'm hoping that they, they pick another industry to... <laughs> okay, to now, do you only work when it's sunshine? No, we work... You can't work in the rain. We work in the rain. You do? Yes, we do. So the the only time we'll ever shut down is if the weather just gets too bad and, and it normally is spring of the year when conditions are uh -huh. are that unfavorable. Well, I didn't realize. Now, how late do you work? It all depends on the schedule of the trucks. We basically know what trucks are coming back, and if, uh, if the trucks are coming back on the right time, we'll be out of here at 5 o'clock, but there's times when they're not back and we're not out until 7 or 8. Uh -huh. Now, they stockpile these chips at uh, at Cornwall. Yes, this some some of these chips are going to Cornwall. This truck being loaded right in front of us right now, that truck is going into Windsor, Quebec. This big one on the left right here. Yes, that trailer was designed to, to run with Quebec weight loss. It, it's different than the other yes, one. Yes, they are. That's a four axle configuration. The other trailer you were looking at is it's three axle. Three axle. Yes. How long will it take him to make a round trip? Like when he leaves here before he comes back, how long? Well, he's already left this morning. He did. Both of these trucks have been in Cornwall. And, well, we're looking at 11 o'clock right now. They would have probably left here somewhere around 8 o'clock this morning. Does that driver work for you or for the owner of the, of the tractor? No, that, that company, Seaway Timber Harvesting, is the owner of the tractor that's us so uh, and he is he is our driver you say seaway is yours that's our company oh i thought you didn't have a tractor you no. didn't own the tractor no we own eight tractors of our own and oh, have five hired. okay the one that you hire do you the man work for you or do he work for the tractor owner he works for the tractor owner okay look at that operation unbelievable now you say this will do the same thing but the conveyor belt coming out is an awful lot shorter on this one yes, than the big one. That's what happens with uh, technology. They find different ways that makes it easier for the operator and eventually we will probably, if we keep these older machines, change them all over to the long conveyor. Okay, the man that's operating that up on top, the two people each operate their own machine most of the time? No, They'll, they can move back and forth to either one. Okay, you got a spare? So that when one of these guys don't feel good, uh, or yes, don't, yes, you we do, do have that. And sometimes I'll get in and chip myself, but I try to stay as far away from it as I can. You got an awful lot of answers. <laughs> you got all the answers. Uh, if I ask a question, I shouldn't just say uh, something else. Don't have to answer, you know. 
Uh, I really don't know on some of this, but what a great operation out here. Will they take, the, I don't know if I asked you, did they take all the chips you could bring them? No. Or is there a limit? No, actually they're, we're limited and we're at a point right now where it's been such a nice spring. I'm kind of uh, not sure how the market's gonna go this summer because we're sending wood right now to three different markets just to try to keep everything rolling. And normally at this time of the year, the middle of April or toward the end, everybody needs wood. Let me ask you a tougher question. You may not know this. Of the wood, the chips that Domtar uses, let's say in Cornwall, what percentage do they buy already chipped, or do, and what percentage do they chip themselves? Well, any be idea? Between the flail chips that we're producing and sawmill chips, Domtar uses about 40% chips, and then they buy about 60% bulk wood. That's that's a rough figure, but okay, yeah. I, I think I'm within the margin. Okay, they, they, they chip that themselves? Yes. Okay. Everything working real good this morning? Is it extra good or...? No, it, it usually goes like this every day. It's a nice yeah. sunny day and uh, probably your worst conditions is when it rains all day oh, long. Oh, I'm sure, I'm sure. Yes. They really feed that wood in there, don't they? Yes. Now you can see the... Uh, the trailer to the right is uh, three quarters plus full. All the windows are full now. Yes. Now, do they close part of the door so they can fill it right up to the very end? Well, the, the way it's set up is there's there's top doors within the rear doors of that trailer, and they open one of them to put the the blower spout of the chipper in. You, actually, you want to get in every chip you possibly can. Well, because of the trip. It all depends on where it's going and the, the time of the year. There's different times of the year when the wood is heavier, so then we'll cut down on the, the weight of the, the load, or the size of the load. In case you just tuned in, we're, not, we're in uh, the area of Boar's Forks, Cannons Corners. We're on property that's owned by Leonard Drown, who's made a contract, I guess, with Pat to, for that he can remove so much wood off his land. How did you find out about uh, Leonard Drown? Well, Leonard had heard about us, and he gave me a call, and that's that's basically how it how it turned out. We cut about eighty thousand cords a year through New York State, some in Ontario, so we're all over, and uh, I guess word of mouth travels. Well, now, let's explain for the people what a cord is uh, in your well, terminology. Okay, basically. Most people that I talk to think in cords, except for the market, so that's why I, I'm using cords. Everything that we sell, of course, goes by the ton, but some of the paper companies look at cord by weight today, and uh, it's probably figured anywhere from 5,000 to 5,600 pounds. But I'm thinking of in, in, in diameter. People think of a face cord, which is uh, eight by four, right? Okay. It, but uh, just the end of it, but you're talking eight by four by how long? Eight by four by eight is what a measured cord Okay, is. there you go. Eight feet long uh, from front to back, and, and from sideways eight feet and four feet high. You think a piece of, a pile of wood like that is one cord. Yes. And how many cards would you think you would do in a year? Annually between the, the two operations, we're doing about 80,000. 80,000 cards. Can the woods replenish themselves fast enough to keep you going? Yes, yes. A lot of the stands that we're doing, back when we were running a conventional operation, the material was unmerchantable for anything like that. So really there's a lot of wood that we're cutting that the average contractor was cutting by hand wouldn't touch anyway. Okay. Uh, you're watching Hometown Cable. We'll take a short break and uh maybe move to a different location a little bit, but uh, I, I hope you're really enjoying this. Uh, we've had a couple of comments at our couple of shows where we're talking to people aren't always as uh, watchable. They can listen well, but today you're gonna see a lot with your eyes as well as what you hear uh, with the excellent commentary here of a man by the name of Pat Curran. You see his name on the side of the truck, the trailer, Curran, C-U-R-R-A-N. One of the main men right here, Pat Curran. Well, 
going to get into the business end a little bit of this, Pat. Now, uh, if there's something you don't want to mention, just say, uh, just pass by it, all right? What we're wondering is buying and selling wood. You're selling chips to one of three companies, you said, right? Yes. You are buying wood, dumpage, standing, whatever, from, in this case, the person by the name of Leonard Drown. How do you pay him? I don't mean a number of dollars, but how do you pay him? How is it computed? And how do you sell? On what basis? Well, I sell, I mentioned it earlier, everything by the ton. Yes. And in this particular case, we're buying by the ton. But in a lot of our, our private jobs, we'll buy, we'll look the stand over and come up with an agreed price for the the wood that they want to sell. And then, it, of course, it depends on so many different variables, how they want to cut, what quantity of material is going to be coming off per acre. And then again, it, it comes into the factor of the trucking distance to the market, the time of the year, and everything else. Based on what you pay, you mean? That's right. Okay, so in this case, uh, it's tonnage and tonnage. That's right. You go in with that trailer, it'll put it on a scale, weigh it, deduct the, uh, the weight of the trailer which they have, and the difference is the amount of the uh, chip. That's right. And then and that's kept, and when you get paid, it'll well, give you a... What happens at the mill, the mill takes a sample out of each load, and when, it, when I'm buying from the landowner by the ton, we do everything by green tons, so no matter what the sample that comes out, they get paid the same. But I get paid different depending on the quality of the fiber and uh, the density of the fiber. Paper is made out of dry weight fiber. And the average tree is carrying about 40% moisture unless you get into, your, say, your soft or hardwood like poplar and basswood, which would be running at 50%. I have an advantage a little bit is that I when I worked at U.S. Customs, I handled all the uh, paper product. I handled wood for a while, so I'm quite familiar. They talk about an air-dry ton and so forth with uh, pulp wood coming in, uh, uh, wood pulp coming in, and I know what air-dry is, and that's what they're talking about. They, they want to know what, what's going to be at the end, how much is really... Well, there's a probably on, as far as, are you talking... Uh, say for this load of chips, what kind of paper is going to be made out of that? No, or? I know you're making, generally you're making a sulfite paper, I yeah, think. A I'm, higher grade paper. Uh, probably a writing paper, or that type of thing. Yeah, well, as far as that that particular wood that's going in there right now, will probably run anywhere from 58 to 60% fiber. Fibers, okay. That's now, <clears throat> there are two ways you can make... Uh, Your your uh, what I want to say your pulp your your solution to make paper one is to take a big log and grind it down and yeah. all right and you can keep grinding to get little tiny sharp chips and it's a grinding process with heat and pressure the other way is to take chips put them in a big vat and you either inject sulfate or a sulfite chemical to dissolve. The lignum that holds the chip together, you get longer fibers with uh, sulfite, I believe. Your hardwood gives you longer fibers than you would if you were grinding it. Most of the uh, paper, uh, newspapers, is done with a sulfate or the other process or a combination of the two. Yeah. Is that? Well, I can't really answer that, okay. but as far as I know, most paper companies are getting a away from the sulfate for environmental reasons exactly. and they're going to a peroxide treatment of some kind. Well, if you go to a mill and you see the old process where they grinders, they have big stones uh, and uh, they got carborundum and they keep turning these wheels and they grind the wood. And it's a very uh, messy, a lot of water, you can see it. When you go to a sulfite mill or a sulfate where they dissolve, they're in big tanks like small silos and you see nothing. Yes. You see the chip go in and you see uh, something come out and into the paper mill. Now, a lot of these will really stockpile these. And I do know that in Cornwall, the chips sometimes 
are not unloaded right at the mill. They're located maybe uh, 500 feet away and they're blown through tubes with air to get from the pile. Uh, is, is that still happening like yes, that? Yes, the same thing. Okay, it's like a long, it's like that pipe that's unloading here, but it's going maybe 500 or more feet all the way around the, the mill to get into where it's going. Here comes another trailer in again. My question would be the road. I can't believe these roads were like this when you got here. Well, we had to upgrade the road to get these big trucks over, oh. make our corners bigger. The main thing you don't want to be doing is pushing and pulling trucks and trailers. Right. Can you imagine, Pat, the man who made this road originally, uh, 70 years ago, he never envisioned... Uh, there's the back end, you can see the division, where you can blow it in and still come all the way to the bottom. They did never envision vehicles like this coming into these woods. I've, I've been to a lot of places throughout the northern New York where I've I envisioned things of 70, 80 years ago where you see stone walls and trees 20 yep. inches on both sides of the stone wall. I haven't seen anybody lift anything with his hand since I've been here. No, it's, there's very little little uh, physical work unless it comes right down to when you have a major breakdown, then, then it becomes uh, hands-on. Yeah. I certainly don't mean they're not working, but they're using their head as much as their muscles here. Well, this is a brain operation right here. I feel uh, different places we've been around the country and, and in Canada, and we have probably as sophisticated automated business as any in the forest industry. Is there anything that you could get that you don't... Is this the very latest right here? That I, well, the other one's newer, but is this the, the, the biggest innovation right here? Yeah. Well. As far as making a in the woods paper chip, yes. How long have they had machines like this? You've had it since 1990, but how long has machines like that been available? Well, there was a competitor, uh, Eugene, Oregon, has had a machine out for probably since uh, 87, 88. But we bought the first floor bark, which was produced in 91. Okay, now, I look at those trees, and there's no leaves on them. That's right. What are you going to do in two months from now? They're going to have all those leaves on when they get here? That's right. We'll have uh, more debris at the chipper. A big different operation. You can't see as well. All that'll be all clouded in with leaves. That's right. Okay. We'll take another short break in here. Uh, you, as you see that machine has slowed down and they keep bringing that wood in here. I, they probably re restocking in the back that we're not seeing. Are other uh, skitters coming well, in? On this particular site, there's six skitters running, and uh, four of them we own. One is a hired skitter, and one is a skitter that uh, it's on demo from Caterpillar. What's your newest employee? How long has your newest employee been with you? Well, it's strange that you ask that. Uh, he's on the other job, and he's driving truck, and he started Monday. Oh. <laughs> we have. Uh, one fellow that's that takes the winter off because he has a a bad joint, and we switch drivers back and forth, and uh, he's came back on. So that's that takes care of that. Would you say that every employee you hire has got some experience of some kind? No. 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 When I I've hired people uh, completely green. Where do they start? They, Where do they start? They start right here working with. Uh, Tim mainly around the chipper. They, like you know, watching the yes. dead who's watching, yes. yes. No, there's there's times when you, you just can't get the experience you want, you've got to train them. And, but you know, when you say he's doing he's, <clears throat> he's working with Tim next to the machine, he's still doing a very, very important job. You gotta have somebody there. Yes he is. <coughs> and this, the same thing on the other job, Mark has trained quite a few operators and in the woods, uh, on feller bunchers, I've helped train some. Lee, you just plain, it's uh, it's ongoing all the time. And then you get guys that are moving internally within the system, and learning different jobs. You know, when we were brought up on a farm uh, to drive the horses with the old hay loader or uh, a truck to pick up the, the chips, you know, the hay being brought. 
a 12-year-old could do it, a 13-year-old, but he was doing the work of a 30-year-old man because yes. he wasn't there, would take it. You know, you've got to have a person there. Okay, we'll take a short break now and we'll be right back. The noise is very heavy in the back. We hope you can hear us all right. Uh, what we got, what do we have here, Pat? This is the sample door where the mill takes their, their sample out of. For the, the way we're, we're paid is they pull a sample and they deduct for anything such as, in this particular bunch right here, uh, right here I see a piece of bark. Okay. We'll get deducted for that. The rest of this will be considered good chips. Even like that, if that happens to be in the sample, they will carve that piece of bark off that. Who will? At the mill. And then whatever whatever happens to turn out, that's how the whole load is based. We want to keep everything in there. <laughs> yes. Uh, you can see. That's uh, not a good piece right now. Now you got to remember, that was a, a log before, and look what it does to it. Now, how often do you have to sharpen those blades to replace them? Well, we're changing knives about every other load. Is that correct? Yes, and they're not necessarily dull, but you can't get the quality of chip with, unless the knife is sharp. Yeah, are they on an area where we can see the, uh, the knife? Is well, that what, is that what... I'm sure probably after these loads will be loaded, okay. they'll be opening up a chipper. Okay. Now, we, uh, Calvin was asking you that we don't see many chips at the top of this window like you did before. So he was wondering if there's something happening wrong and you said this is going to Canada? It, no, this, this trailer is going into Windsor, Quebec. And Quebec has a different weight law than Ontario and New York. Between April 13th, or March 13th rather, and May 10th, they've got different specs. And uh, we're just trying to abide by them. Look at that, excuse me, look at that ground move down there. Uh, excuse me for a minute. You can see the ground move as that thing. Uh, that, look, look at the way that closed. Can you show us that again? Oh, he's going, okay. Now you said that they don't fill it up because of the weight limit in Canada. Right. Well, it's the weight limit in Quebec, in Quebec, not Canada. Okay, in Quebec, and then, uh, is he going to go out a different way? No, he's probably pulling over to fuel up his truck. Oh, okay. But if they load their tractors and all your equipment from the same gas thing here. Your gas or your fuel oil is done right here. Yes. All of it. Okay. Now, you also mentioned that you try to put more of your load on the back than in the front if, you, if you're not filling it. Yes. Because of the axle. That's right. Now this is the bigger one. Bigger chipper? Or no, the bigger uh, skitter. skitter huh? that, that is, that's a 748. That's the 748. Now, does he normally work in the yard here? No, you really can't tell which one unless you know the operator. Okay. Where they're coming back. They look identical. Look at the size that he's picking up. There again, that material is going back to the fixed road or just be dumped on site. Now the unit way in the back is doing what? Oh, he's pulling the lumber logs out. Yes, but this particular stand is a very low grade log stand and it's it's mainly uh, a fiber stand. You, you've used the word stand about five times. Give us your definition of what you mean when you say stand. Well, it just happens to be the, the cut that we're on. It might be a hundred acres. You mean an area of yes. the wood? That that's a, you call that the stand? Or, is that a my lawn? It's a stand if it were in the woods. Yeah, I'd say it's stand is different. Okay. And where do you sell your lumber logs? They're all going into Canada right now. This job here, they'd be going into Delkeith, Ontario. All right. It's a tougher question again. But of the total in a day that you do, what percentage would be lumber logs? Of well, the it, that's not really that tough a question. Like it comes back to 
this this stand this stand that much. doesn't <laughs> have a very good quality. Okay. But we've been on stands where you might run 25 to 30 percent. That much. And it's a big difference in the amount of money you're going to get. That's right. But a lot of the the jobs that we'll cut will be heavier toward fiber than they will toward saw logs. The, just the way we're set up, that's a, the type of wood I look for. Say that again. A lot of the jobs that we're cutting are heavier heavier toward fiber yes. than they are okay. toward lumber. So you're primarily fiber That's rather right. than lumber, but lumber is an awful good uh, uh, well, residue, isn't it? It is, and that's one thing you don't ever want to do is, is chip anything that would right. be a nice solid. Now the lumber is sold by grade. That's a little different, that's more right. difficult. We, we, we talked to a man here with a lumber mill by the name of Rogers. And uh, he was showing us how you would grade things, you know. And people don't always see grades the same way either. Yes. He's looking inside of that van right now because he's got to be really careful on the way we load going up there. That's just Canada too. Uh, yes, Quebec. That, that load's going into Quebec also. I can tell that by the wheels more. That's right. We're sending some three axle trailers up right now, but during the, the regulations in this thaw period, it's it's not really uh, economical. All right. Pat, if I ask you, where does your biggest problem lie in this kind of an operation? Could you tell me? Yes. What's your biggest headache? Weather. Weather. All right. Not brothers or anything like no, that. No, no. Weather, huh? No. Now, this is an ideal day. Well, today is perfect. The perfect. Gr ground conditions, everything's perfect. Yeah. But when you get into a situation where you've had rain for a couple days in a row, and yeah. it just seems to kind of slop everything up, that's, that's the worst. Now, you pay your men weekly? Everybody's paid weekly, yes. You get your pay for the bill monthly? Uh, depends on the market. Some of my markets I get paid weekly, some are bi-weekly. In an operation like this, not going to get into the details, but in a normal operation, do you have to float loads for a normal yes, operation? Yes, in, I do. In addition to equipment? That's right. Short term, a week or four days, things like that? No, it, usually you're talking 30 to 60 days. For normal operating capital. That's right. Like your gas, you pay that like on a weekly, monthly? I, I wouldn't dare pay the fuel any other way but weekly. <laughs> you want to make sure it's there the following Monday, huh? That's right. Well, the big problem with the fuel is we use so much that if the bill was put together in one month period, it would be so scary, I don't know if we'd want to look at it. You use that kind of fuel, huh? Yes. We use anywhere from seven to 10,000 gallons a week. Seven? Seven to ten thousand gallons a week. Because this, a lot of this is off-road. You get you. Uh, are you eliminating for some taxes? Yes, we are. I know people know that <coughs> farmers don't pay. They they get a, a gas a little cheaper because it's not road gas. It's for the field, and uh, because it's highway taxes on it, it's not used on the highway. So some of it is because of your trailer, so you have two right. different kinds. Well, I think you noticed on the way in there was two different fuel trucks. Yes. Is this gas or fuel oil? Everything on the job is diesel except for one small air compressor on the front of the chipper. Which is gas. Okay, then one more thing. Except for weather, what's your biggest problem uh, on the premise? Is it... Uh, well, I, I guess other than that, it goes to marketing. You know, if, if we were able to sell all the volume we could produce, year around for say 10 to 20 years we would really have reason to, to smile but we never know what the market is going to bring now, the money you make <clears throat> it's like a farmer he works all day all he does is spend the only money he makes is what he milks at night the only money you make is what's coming out of the end of that right that's right it's and there's a lot a lot of things that go on between before that comes out of the end of that getting that load of chips oh, to the yeah. mill. <clears throat> but to me, you know what, you know what, this is where you've got to be doing it right and efficiently because yes. that's where you start making your money, right there. That's right. 
In this case, you even got to pay to get it where you're going still, too, with the trailer. Everybody has to work together and get along to make the whole program work. Uh -huh. Everybody certainly knows their job here this morning. Yes. There's, there's, there's a little time being lost. No, it's the same, same thing all the time. Everybody works together good. We've got some real good men. Uh-huh. Well, that's the important thing. There must be times, though, like I don't always want to go to work every day before. There are days you just don't want to go to work. You don't feel like it. You well, may not be sick, but... Uh, the way we look at it is you can't really criticize a guy for having a bad day because we'll have bad days ourselves. Yes. But well, you're a young man. How? Uh, uh, what age do someone like yourself retire from a job like this? Well... 60 years old. A little old to be doing this, isn't it? I don't know. If we were heavy into the conventional type of handling four foot wood, I'd hate like hell to be doing it at 60, but doing it the way we're doing, uh, I'd like to be in it a long time. I really enjoy the woods. That's all you've ever done. Well, basically, I had a lot of farm experience before I got into the woods. The hours are nearly as bad here. <laughs> yes, they are, and it's the mechanical part keeping things going I mean it's it's okay. always there in the office work at night it's you go home to eat and, and work that's about it <clears throat> you'll notice that the pile of debris coming off the next time a man comes down he's going to go down and pick up because you're getting high now and if you'll bring this load down drop it and pick up on the way back probably yes no lost motion Where do you buy your equipment? Well, these skidders are bought from, uh, well, it used to be a screw and lake tractor, but now it's KC Canary. That's, where is that? Is it? Well, KC Canary is in Clifton Park, New York, but they also have a branch in Screw Lake, Governor, and in Plattsburgh. A machine like this will last you how long? How many years to something like that? Well, well kept. Our oldest skitter like that is just over three years old and it has 8,500 hours on it. Wow. We're probably going to run another another year or two depending on uh, on market conditions. You'll see why these skitters, look at right on top of the logs, they don't worry about terrain at all. Look at this. Much danger, something like that tipping over? Well, since we've been running the 748 class, we've only tipped over one machine. And it was tipped over on the level. On the level? Yes. Too tight of a turn? Well, when a guy is using that grapple, you gotta be pretty careful sometimes where your load is. You can flop a machine pretty easy. I mean, I would think it takes an awful lot of experience to run one of those. He can't, you know, uh, Ethan, what's your, how long is this guy, this driver, do you know? Approximately? Well, if he clean his windows there, I could tell, <laughs> tell which one he was, but I can't see right okay. I thought when we get out here, we're going to see a, a machine that clamps these trees and just uh, squeezes them right off like a pair of uh, snippers, but that's not the case. Look at that nice clean cut, very low. And now we're going to show you what's doing this. and you. Can, Pat can explain it to us. This is a Timco Feller Buncher with a high speed quadco 22 inch disc saw, which actually you get up to the tree and you cut the tree off before you, you grab it. Before you grab it? Yes. And the, the whole reason is it, it takes a lot less stress on the boom bins. And it has time to fall, you grab it. Just as soon as you, you feel you're going through it, then you grab it. Like right. he's he's cutting multiple stems right now and what, what he's got is a collector on there that allows him to to grab a tree and then, then put more in the same pile. We can't get much closer for several reasons. Uh, one is danger, I suppose. <laughs> uh, but look at how he's just knocking those down and then putting them in a nice little pile. Same end in the, in the direction each time, of course, so that the skitters can come in and, and grab them here. Now, what kind of... Now, there is a machine that, that's, 
that snips yes, rather than yeah, uh, with, with shares. Right. Now you say you like this operation better? Well, mainly if we have any quality saw logs, it doesn't affect the butt of the tree at all. Where a shear filler muncher will actually split the end and you lose sometimes as much as three feet of valuable timber. On the bottom? Yes. And that's where it's biggest, obviously, right? That's right. <laughs> that's where more it chips does, are. That doesn't affect it if you're going to be chipping it, but it, for the saw log part, it will. Uh -huh. That's amazing. Amazing. Hey, remember, they used to have the old uh, axe. First of all, they were cutting them by axe with an axe, and then later they had the cross cut saw. The one man and the two man both, but here we're seeing uh, the way it's done today. And you have two of these on this job. Two on this job and two on another. Uh -huh. Well, again, uh, price range. That machine is 290000 <laughs> But liability right here is where your, your men are stand the biggest chance of getting hurt is cutting down the trees. Uh -huh. And by hand, say if you're using yes. chainsaws. Yes. Yes. Just peace of mind knowing that we don't have a man standing underneath the tree, it's uh, uh -huh. it's worth so much. Now, uh, this man's got a lot of experience. Yes, he is. This fella right here, I I would be lying if I didn't say he was our, our best operator. Okay, now best operator of this kind of machine yes. or? Is, um, On this, yeah. this kind of machine. Okay, unbelievable. Huh? He is, this fella has been with us probably 10 years. But he's done a lot of skidding, truck driving some, and uh, cutting. How old a person is he, give or take? Robert would be close to 30. 30, just, oh, yeah. he's been doing it since he was just out of school, huh? And yes. He's got 10 well, years experience? He's been with you 10 years? Yes. Is he always run this machine? No. No? No, in fact, uh, he is, uh, like I said earlier, he's did a lot of skidding. And a lot of cutting also, by hand. Yeah, by hand too. That's got to be yeah. dangerous. That's where things happen. Like you say, tree chicks back. Uh, they, they fall the wrong way. I guess, not supposed to be a good logger, I guess. It's supposed to fall the right way, but... Uh, well, <laughs> there's... When you're cutting the volume of timber that, that we're cutting today, you're going to have accidents. And this right here pretty well prevents that. Well, I hate to bring it up, but what about accidents? Do you, you, you have many accidents in this kind of operation? Well, we haven't had with with this kind of setup, but we have had accidents in the past. Uh -huh. You're a long way in the woods to get somebody out, huh? Yes. You, of course, you're, uh, you, you're well experienced in first aid, so you could do just about anything. Well, you can you can help somebody. You can help it, somebody, yeah. If it gets very, very yeah. severe, we're all in trouble. Yeah. We just try like hell to never get anybody in a situation yeah. where that, that can happen. Yeah. Liability insurance must be pretty high at an operation like yours. Well, it, it is, but, you know, it's it's part of business. I mean, without it, you can't yeah. roll. Yeah. And with the, the mechanized cutting and, and skidding, we, we find that compared to conventional operations, our compensation rate is, is quite a bit lower. You know, one of the things we were talking about when we last broke was Calvin was asking, <clears throat> He's wondering if there wasn't a way you could get those that what comes off your conveyor there, you know, the residue, and and recycle that in the form of uh, mulch or something where you could sell it. And uh, you explained it to me very easily, but maybe the people should hear why you don't do a thing like that. Well, we've tried it and tried to market <coughs> it at the energy plant in Chattagay, but actually, by the time we got it into a feasible state that they could use it, we'd have to rehog it, and the cost of of hogging that material to get it to their specs and what we would get for the material it's worth way more for us to use it in the woods to make our road systems a lot easier for the skidders. That's the thing we noticed as we drove out here that you're you're dropping it in the roadway and it makes it nice and it's filling in and stuff. Yes. But when you say hog, what do you mean by hog? Well you'd actually put it through a machine that would, would more or less any long pieces or large pieces would break them down to a a size diameter that the energy plant asks for. Can you imagine a man who was working in these woods 70 years ago watching a tree come down like this? Oh, I know it. He probably couldn't imagine that you could cut a beach like that in one second. <laughs> no way. And oh. then pick it up and put it where you want it. Yep. yep. That's got to be where a lot of the experience is. He knows which one to cut first, how it's going to fall, everything else, huh? Yes. Look at that. The way that's, that's going to operate. 
How often do you get a machine stuck in the mud or well, you can't move? We've had these machines stuck and it's scary when you get them in because when the tracks go completely under, you've got to have a lot of power to pull them. Yeah. But if you have base underneath and you have material that you can put the head on, you can almost always pull yourself back out. You put logs under them and so forth, does that help? We have had we to. have to do that. Huh? Well, I guess now the question Calvin had way back, I don't know, a little early for me to think about it, but uh, you get a lot of part of May, first part of June, you have a lot of company out here in the woods with you. <laughs> uh, the so-called black flies. Uh, well, it's not as bad as it used to be with most of the operators being in machines. And those are the days where you hope that you've got a good breeze. Yeah. So, the black flies are no fun. So when you get out in some of these woods, you don't get the breeze. Uh, that is that machine air air cooled. I mean, the air, air conditioning inside. Yes. It is. Uh, yes. They got to be tough in the middle of the summer. Well, it's you have your engine sitting right beside you and your hydraulics running behind you and. Without an air conditioner, you, you couldn't stand to run the machine. Yeah. And I would also think that when he gets home at night, as well as you others, must rest very well at night. It's oh, easy yes. to get to sleep, huh? Yeah, that machine takes a lot out of you during the day. Five days a week? Uh, Five days. Uh, always off Saturday and Sunday? Saturday and Sunday you don't work? Is that the idea? Well, Saturday and Sunday, the only time we'll work is if it's mechanically related or if we get in a situation where we have a mill that really needs volume. And, uh, and we need to work. Okay. We've we, done it a lot of times. You have. Okay. We'll take a short break. We're going to move location. Bob Venn with the mic. Calvin Castine with the camera. Hometown Cable. What's going on here? We've moved up. To, it's safe now. The motor is off. And uh, this is what the business end looks like, Pat. Tell us a little bit about what we're looking at. Basically, what you're looking at is this is a Quadco 22-inch saw head. And down here are your teeth. This, this machine has 16 teeth on it. But turn at a high velocity, and that's what cuts the tree. It takes a 2-inch kerf. And as you can see that those teeth have nicked some stone. This is very stony ground that we're on. And as, uh, as the tooth wears, you will come to a point where you just, it's very hard to cut the trees. It takes too much time to, to go through and build your speed back up. So you'll turn the tooth to a new edge, which if you don't hit a stone too bad, you get three chances. Explain us what you mean by that. Can you show us what you're talking? Okay, basically, this is your tooth, uh -huh. and all your cutting is being done right here on this point and along this side. Right. And this this will wear first, so then you will loosen up the bolt here, slide the tooth out, and turn it one notch. And that'll give you a new face Just to flip it around, and then the bottom here would be where this one is, and this would be where this one is. Yes. And. Uh, uh, how long uh, would something like that, I, I know it depends on the well, terrain. Well, if and you're cutting in sand, ground, or muck, you could go a lot of times, you know, a month or two. But in cutting in stone like this, you could hit a stone today and put a new set of teeth in and, and not catch yourself just right and, and rock them, you know, <laughs> actually your next, yeah. next tree. Because this is very stony. So you replace just this piece right here? Yes, and these holders that hold the tooth. They get worn enough, you replace them once a year. You do. The now, the teeth, are they ever sharp, resharpened, or do you just put well, a whole new you one? Can, you can do it, but we don't. You don't, don't, don't bother we with We feel them. they're worn enough that when we get done with them, we just let them uh -huh. And as we were mentioning, I did not realize, you know, they do not squeeze the tree and then cut it. The, the tree, is, as you can see, is cut from way out here, and then as it goes in, and then these clamps come in and pull it in. Right? Yes. The clamps don't do anything until the tree is cut. Well, it's all done by the operator. Okay. There's nothing automatic about that. The operator has to read what's happening. So he, he operates it. And this here is a collecting arm. If you're cutting small diameter trees and you want to cut three or four trees, or say before you dump, you will grab with this and it allows your, your main grab arms to come back out. So this, this rides on the ground yes. generally? So that's why they're getting them down low, and it's also the reason why you hit some stones, because there's a lot of stone back in here. That's right. But you try try to get them as low as you can. 
This way the, the skidders don't have to worry about driving over them. The feller buncher doesn't have to worry about working around them. And at the same time, that's where the, the biggest part of your tree is, most volume. Yeah. Now, you can see they aren't going to cut this tree. This is a good stumpage here. We're not going to get a chance to cut this one. And we were looking to, for waiting room to cut another one back here, but you can see why. Leonard's got his maple taps on here. And you can see that they're going to have to stop within this row of, uh, of uh, plastic pipes. They can only go back here another 15 feet, and they're going to be, you know, just a few more in here as you're cutting. This is kind of like a little alcove in here yes. that you're doing. Uh, Leonard owns uh, 400 or so acres back in here, and uh, can't be used for anything else except wood or maple, right? I, I would say. You can't pretty, get back much back in here. <laughs> All right, so this, uh, and they're, they're on tracks. It can go just about any place on path. Well, yes. This machine is designed for mainly for selective cutting and steep slopes. And there's places where they've, they've used this machine in good terrain working at a 50% grade. 50% grade. Do you also, you always have tracks on all your cutters like this? They're all on track. They're all on track, okay. How much weight we have on a machine like this? This machine weighs about 30 ton. Now to fill the gas on this, you bring the gas to him? Well, normally what we'll try to do is, is work in an area so that the operator is working his way back toward the fuel truck at the end of the day so he doesn't have to walk too far without actually using the machine. You mean when the day is done he don't have to walk back to the clearing back there? He can, uh, he can drive this back? Well, what happens in, in some areas when you're on level ground, you can carry enough fuel where you can go two days. So the machine will stay in the woods uh -huh. the odd day, but the other day out. Got a name for your machine? What is it? Timco. Is that the name of the, of the company? Don't you have a, a, your own name for it? You didn't call it Susie or, or anything like that? <laughs> I heard you heard that booth quite a bit. <laughs> Now, I, I, I hesitate to ask, you've got lights on there. You expect this man to work in the dark? Well, we have at times. Is that right? Yeah. <laughs> Especially when you get in the, the fall when the days are getting shorter. And then when the, the time changes, we, we get caught a lot of times when we have to work at night. Uh-huh. This is where it starts, right here. Two of these keeps all those skitters moving. Uh, what is the best area to work? What What's your best? terrain, uh, what, what, if you could draw a picture of where you want to work, well, how close you want the trees? Or? I, want them, I want them about five minutes from home. Yes. <laughs> and on sand land. Uh, yes. Okay. And one right beside the other. <laughs> but it doesn't always For the next out. 20 years. Yes, I'd like that. You'd like that. We'll take, we'll take a short break. Well, you people who just, might have just tuned in, we're up just outside of uh, Kenneth's Corners, up near Moore's Forks. We're not very far from the Gulf. We're in the deep woods, and we're here with a, I don't know the name of the company, I've already forgot it, but we'll tell you, one of the men we're talking to, the man we have been talking to is Pat Curran, C-U-R-R-A-N, and he is the, the big cheese of this company, one of them anyway, we've got three brothers, Tim, Lee, and Pat. I should have said Lee, Pat, and Tim in alphabetical order, then I'm not playing any favorites. <laughs> very good. If you're wondering why Pat don't buy all his people uniforms like this, it's because this is not one of Pat's men that doesn't work for the company. Uh, he's here on some kind of a detail. What are you here? Well, what are you doing? The, Pat and Lee have stuck a new hydraulic pump on, on this machine, and we're up here. Before you go too far, Pat and Lee is the owners of this, the company that builds that Oh, machine. I assume when he was saying Pat and oh. Lee, I thought, oh, <laughs> all right. Okay. So we're not talking about his brothers, not this oh, Pat. Okay, okay. All right, tell us again. The manufacturer of this machine okay. is, is put a new pump on it. A new style hasn't been used on this particular machine before. So we came up to the job site to actually do some testing on it in the woods, doing what it really does. Okay, and you, for adjustments and so forth. What just, yeah, we're we're just checking to make sure that it's uh, that it's going to work in this type of application. You uh -huh. know, see what kind see what kind of pressures they get out of it. Uh -huh. And your name? Bob Fraze. How you spell your last name? It's F R A S E. Okay, where are you from? Uh, I'm out of Worcester, Ohio. Come a long way to 
Check this. How long have you been here? I got here this morning. Well, I, I flew in last night, come up job site this morning. Uh -huh. You'll be leaving in a day or two? I'll be leaving here after I take all my stuff yeah. off. We're, we're about done. You don't have a very big uh, suitcase here. What are you carrying? Just laptop computer. Has that got all the things you need to know in it? Well, it has some things I you, need you, to know in it. Do you, do you uh, make it a message? Or, uh, are you working out figures? or? No, it's. I have... Um, instrumentation on the machine it's that, recording that it will put it in there it, yeah it records it there and then i suck all i hook a little cable up the back and and put all the information in the computer unbelievable and take unbelievable. it back to the factory and let the engineers take a look at everything unbelievable the way it's happening we and that'll tell you so right at this point you don't know how it's doing at all oh yeah we i just oh you know when, when he stopped i just pulled and looked at it and looked at all the data and it, it tells me, you it something looks, it looks good to me oh yeah telling you a lot all bunch of numbers yeah graphs and such. Uh -huh. and, and looks numbers. good. Yeah, you looks give good. it your approval. Yeah, it looks real good. You're going to let them work the rest of the day on Oh, yeah. They're gonna... <laughs> what does that machine do? To, what, what does that hydraulic do? Runs all R the hydraulic on there? Up, all the, the boom, the booms and the, uh, you know, clamps, everything uh -huh. on everything on that. And it replaces uh, one they had on before uh, with an improvement. Is that the idea? Yeah. Now, who's Pat and Mike? They, they build the, the hydraulic? Is that? Oh, Pat and oh, Lee. Pat I beg your pardon. Yeah, Pat and... They, they, I said Mike. Pat and Lee. They came up with the machine. That's their machine design. It's their design. machine design. All right. And we just supply hydraulics to them. That don't happen very often. We get two names and they're part of the, pretty the same name as yourselves here. I thought you owned this here. It's your brother. So that whole thing is run on uh, on hydraulics, yeah. huh? We're a long way from the battery source. We, we just changed batteries again, or Calvin did. And, so, Bob, where will you go from here? Back to Ohio? Yeah, I'm on my way back to Ohio. And then what do you do? You go out to a different job to check like this? Yeah, we do a lot of things like, you know, a uh, customer wants to use more of our product, we'll go out and do some testing on their equipment, or uh -huh. I'll, I'll go back and assist the guys that are doing repairs and, and testing in the facility. So do you make uh, hydraulic, what do you call it? What do you call it? Hydraulic that? pump. Hydraulic wow. pump for other than... Operators uh, in the woods of all different yeah, kinds yeah. of operators. A lot of road construction equipment, uh, a lot of forestry, the agricultural market, we're into that uh -huh. pretty heavily. So what did you major when you at you at college? What did you major? In uh, fluid power. I don't understand that very well either, but yeah, okay. So you, hydraulics. So you basically. don't manufacture, you don't do anything on the manufacturing part. You're mostly on the testing? Uh, yeah, yeah. I'm just testing. I don't, I don't get involved with manufacturing. Travel all over the United States? Yeah, all over the United States. Not married yet, huh? Oh, yeah. Oh, you are? Well, yeah. your wife must love that. She doesn't mind. You know, you're in and out a day or two in each place? Is that the way you work out? Generally speaking, yeah. Okay. Thank you very much for talking yeah. to us. And welcome to the North. Have you been up here before? I've been up in this area once before. I, I, I like it up here. It's nice. What were you doing up here before? Oh, same kind of thing. Yeah, yeah some points and machines. Yeah. So you're uh, nothing was nothing was happening that it was any problem. You just came to see how it was working. Before? Or now? This now, time? Now. This oh, time? Oh yeah, just to come up to check. Okay, it out. so if something did go wrong with that hydraulic, you'd be one of the repairmen up and fix it. Yes. Or I replace can. it and bring the yeah. other one back. I, I could be one of the guys that would do, do that. How big of a unit is this? Uh, if you were, like, will it fit in oh, a bushel basket? Uh, yeah, it'll fit in a bushel basket, but your bushel basket probably ain't strong enough to hold it. No. Hundred thousand dollars for that pump? That pump? Uh, I, I, I don't know. Huh? <laughs> and, and, and twenty thousand for your job coming up. You have to pay this man to come up here today. <laughs> I, he hope, his old. I hope not. You hope not. Right. <laughs> this, is, this is the freebie. That's the freebie, and we're not going to pay you either, well, and we're not oh. going to charge you, about Bob. <laughs> anyway, thanks very much. Okay. Here I thought that Bob came all the way from Ohio all by himself, got lonesome on the trip, and then Pat mentioned there was another person who came with him, and not only the person that came with him, but I guess you'd have to say the inventor of this head on this machine. And uh, he, he did consent reluctantly, right, yes, to talk with us. Shy. He said, you're not, you're, not a, you're not a camera person? No, I'm not. Oh, you'll do well. All right. Chuck, it's Chuck. It uh, is. Your name again, Chuck? is Chuck McLennan. McLennan. And uh, you work with? Quadco and Timco. Okay. How long have you been with them? Uh, we started this off originally in 1978, I guess. Okay. So whatever that is. Okay, you say we. Are you an employee or you own part of the company? I own Quadco, and we distribute these Timco machines in eastern Canada and upstate. Okay, so Quadco is that front end here? Is that what right. you're talking about? Right. So, so this is the machine made up of two different parts. Correct. They own that and you own this part. Well, we change the attachment depending on what work okay. we want the machine to yep. do. 
Right, what kind of background do you have to get into this kind of machinery? What's your background before coming in 78 with this company? What a question to ask. You know? Well, you're not going to believe I'm not going to detail it. You'll tell me that you are a cook. No, but almost something as bad as <laughs> yeah. I was a banker. You were a banker. Yeah. Well, yeah, you yeah. go from the cooking to banking. Yeah, and never, you saw where all the money went. In spite of my size, I'm not a cook. <laughs> <laughs> well, is it a little bit different than sitting behind a in a bank? Huh? Quite different. Yeah. Money. That was too. 20 years ago. Yeah, the money's different too. Huh? Banker don't make probably oh. less money in this than, than there was in banking. You told me you tell Maybe me only. more of mine, but <laughs> more of other people's than the other. Okay, Chuck. So that. Uh, when that company started, you this is your invention, shall I say? Uh, how would a banker get involved in inventing something like for the woods or for th this kind of equipment? Because I originally lent a group of uh, people money to get involved in the uh, production of forestry equipment. So that was my first exposure to it, and I just gradually got more and more involved in it, and then finally I decided, gee, that looked like fun, maybe I'll do that as well. Was there a prototype that was different and you improved on it or did you just start from scratch and come up with this? With this, oh, the head itself? Yes, the head. Um, the actual the concept of that head has been around since, uh, well, originally somewhere in the late 80s, uh, excuse me, early 80s. So okay. we took the concept and we just enhanced it. A little okay. Bit, trying to get more and more productive okay. so that the cost of operating the machines would be less and less. Per okay, hour. then I guess I'd have to ask you if you're going to be the salesman now. What's different about your head and somebody else's, and why why is it an advantage? Uh, there, there are technical reasons, but uh -huh. uh, the type of disc used in tooth system is unique. And Being four-sided, the others don't yes, have the, the four-sided? rotatable side. tooth. And yep. yes. The concept is you, you fail in layers, so that if you hit something, well, you can rotate the tooth. If you hit it real bad, well, you'd have to take the tooth off and change it. And, of course, if you had a disaster, well, then you'd have to change the holders. But never would you have to change the big wheel. And so far, so good, except for the previous owner here who fell off a rock cap with his machine and bent one. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. But we've trained him subsequently. He hasn't so you say yet. previous, this was a used machine when Pat bought No, no, I was just teasing him. Oh, you're, oh, you're teasing him. Machine, on a previous machine, you had an accident with one, and they, yeah. they fell off a rock cap, and we you, bent the blade. You don't right. realize that. We're so serious. We don't ever tease at all. We're, oh, we're, I see. we're okay. very, very... Oh, you, I, you didn't I realize that? Pardon, you didn't realize... You actually got to act a banker here now. Okay. <laughs> In any event, the concept was that you, you fail an uh -huh. inexpensive piece uh -huh. on a regular basis, Makes so sense. to speak, yes. rather than failing the yes. expensive piece. Yeah. I know the lumber saws, the big ones in the mills, they replace individual teeth, you know, instead of replacing the whole yes. saw. Well, we've taken this this concept here, which is a two and a quarter inch tooth, uh -huh. and we've reduced it down to a half inch tooth, and it is ending up on a lot of these slasher decks to the infeeds of the various mm -hmm. mills, again with a concept that you can yeah. rotate the tooth. Except for wanting to leave Ohio for a couple of days, what are you doing here these couple of days? Well, I'm from Montreal. So the, I cover this territory here in, in eastern Canada. So you're a salesman, a service person? Yeah, I do everything. everything. I'm you not do very everything. good at any of them. That's why I have to do so many of them. <laughs> and your home is in Montreal? Yes, it is. Are you Canadian or yes, U.S.? I am. You're I'm Canadian. Parlez français, M.C. Oui, oui, oui. Yeah, you do that too? Oui. <laughs> well, you have... You say you can replace the head. The head is different for different type of machines? Right. The concept of this machine yep. in the, started out in the Lake States. And it was... It evolved around... Uh, selective cutting and the concept was is if the tracks of the machine would go between two standing trees well you could reach out harvest a tree and turn around and put the tree behind you without scuffing or, or taking the bark off the standing timber that's why there's no counterweight on the back of the machine so as you can reach out turn around between the two standing trees and put the tree behind you so the counterweight would make it longer is that yes. what you're saying and as you rotated the upper structure of course the counterweight would scuff or debark okay well now of course you've got to remember I, I don't know much about lumber but i know that a counterweight is there for a reason yes. so it don't tip right so what how do you counteract that here well if you if you could maybe pan to the yeah. back of the machine you'll see that the boom is pinned the back, on the back of the machine instead of in the front and timco actually has a patent on that boom positioning so the weight of the boom acts as a counterweight yep. to the weight of the yep. lever. Pretty like here. a fifth wheeler in a pickup truck rather than at the end of a tailgate. Well, that's the idea. That's yes, exactly. Back further back. Yeah. It's exactly that. It's a question of leverage. I don't take me long to, to catch on, does no, it? Huh? I catch well, on same, quick. It's the same principle. And I never had banking experience well, either. No, ahead of that. 
If you've driven a pickup with it pinned on the back versus pinned on a fifth wheel, you know the difference. Did you do banking in Montreal? Yes, I did. No wonder you quit the job. Why is that? It was a robbery every well, other you, weekend. Well, you heard the Canadian dollar is only worth 70 cents. <laughs> yeah. so I did, out of desperation, I had to get out of it. In any event, the concept was that it was a selective cut uh -huh. machine. Uh -huh. So that you could selectively harvest the weaker trees and leave the good ones to grow. Mm -hmm. And you change the attachment here depending on what functions you want the machine to perform. I see. So do you... Uh, did you sell this machine to the... To Pat? Yeah? Yes, I did. How'd you pick out him? You, you knew he was in business, you looked up Dun & Bradstreet and went and saw him? No, I think we first met at probably a trade show, or uh, actually a friend of ours introduced each other. Mm -hmm. Introduced us. Huh? He's, He's not a friend anymore? <laughs> <laughs> the other guy or me? <laughs> now listen, uh, Ed, tell me the truth. Is, is it pretty easy so far? What's that? What we're doing. Oh, I see. I thought you were that beating up Wasn't that pretty easy? Yeah. No, but we're... Yeah, so far. So I guess the, the tough part comes the, now. It's not any tough part. That's I the see. easy part. Yeah. You, you tell me what you'd like to tell me, because I don't know anything else at this point. Well, let me ask. Each pipe controls a certain part of the arm. Is that what's happening? Correct. This machine runs all hydraulically. It uses a diesel engine to turn some hydraulic pumps. And all the functions on the machine operate hydraulically. Okay. So what, when you operate this, one. Does that one automatically close too? Yes. Oh, so you don't have to operate them individually. But he can operate the top without the bottom or the right. bottom without the top, so he's doing well, all that's that. The west, that's the way he can grab several trees at once. Uh -huh. Otherwise, you'd only grab one tree and then have to turn around and put it on the ground. Okay. It wouldn't be as productive. So you didn't get a chance to fly down here. There's no, no airport in Canada's corners. No. no. You drove down this that morning, huh? Right. only took me an hour. We're only a mile from the Canadian border. Yeah. Don't mention that because they know how far it is and they'll know how fast you were going. Oh, you see. better be careful on I that. See. Some police watch this. One other thing that is unique about this, the yeah. machine itself, if you, you see the two cylinder rods that are, uh, that are extending out of the lower car body, that allows the machine to keep itself horizontal all the time, no matter what the undercarriage is doing. Does that automatically? No, the operator, the operator has, has to, to do, do that too. So he, when he finds where he is, then he kind of adjusts it? He adjusts himself so that he sits horizontal yeah. all the time. Does he have some kind of a... Of a level engage that yes, he can follow in yes. addition to his the, mind, he the does? The seat of his pants. He's, oh, okay, yeah, but he, usually he does it based that. on where, yeah. okay. But no little thing uh, no. like on the camera. Well, you know, like on a trailer, you're a, you, you must be a good big RV guy. No, but my, you my initials. Use, you could use two mercury switches and it would do the same thing. Okay. My, my initials are RV. That's the only thing I do oh, with I RV. Okay. Now, he's getting an RV uh, this weekend, renting one. Right? take a long trip. Tell them about RV. You know anything about I know, RV? Nothing about nothing RV. about RVs. Yeah, so, all you're right. Not trapping me into that one. Not gonna... However, <laughs> that leveling system would be the same concept. That's a great thing. That's a, that's a great innovation. Is that on most of the machines like this? It's on every model we make. You mean of our manufacturing? Uh, yeah, all yes. you. But other other companies do no, that. No, they, this they'll is copy it now. Now, if a person, because you've got that, and they want to use that idea, they can do it as long as they do it a little bit different, can't they? Well, it depends whether or not you infringe on any claims of the patent. But if they did it on a different basis, I don't know, they did it sideways and come down at a different angle. You didn't, you didn't, you don't have a well, patent on the idea. You have an, you have a patent on the. Well, there's two different types of patents. There's okay. a method patent and then there's a system patent. All right. So it depends depends on what class that patent. Do you have both? Uh, not a system no, and a that, method. No, that tilting device is not patented. All right. It was first used in Sweden, actually. Okay. Several years ago. Anything else you want to tell me about that machine? No. You want to get the heck off this TV? Here? No, no, no. no. You, you're enjoying it. Pretty, no, I think that I think we've more or less dis described. Uh, okay. Listen, I really thank you for putting up with me and for and for talking. Um, we're very serious, but we do it on a on a on an enjoyable vein mm -hmm. if possible. Oh, uh, the people don't know up up from down a machine like this. I've never seen one up close before, and we've learned quite a bit. And thank you very much. You're quite welcome, sir. Welcome back. Well, we, we didn't tell your Pat out, but we're, we have a chance to meet Tim. Tim Curran, his brother. Hi, Tim. Yes. I've already identified you as being older than Pat. I didn't say how much, all right? That okay? <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> I found out there were eight boys, too. So we're at the machine, and we're going to... You heard him talk about chains. Are these are spares, I guess. These are curtain chains up here. Okay, we're going to show you now what he means by chains, what they do. Remember, they debark the log, correct? Yes. Okay, now you can explain. We're on the far side, the opposite side where we were before with all the pictures. And these drums spin approximately around 400 revolutions to 480. And these chains are spinning. And they're, as the tree is passing through, this drum here is cleaning the bottom half of the tree. Doesn't seem possible. Something so smooth could clean off the... But it does. And there's also another drum up above here that floats up and down on the tree, varying various sizes. And that cleans the top half. Also spinning? Also spinning. 
and then the bark is driven down into this pit falls off and goes out this conveyor which you've seen on the other side okay and, and this is the the other ones that are going through yeah. to get over to where they're going to be chipped what these yes these are feed wheels they help carry the wood through okay there's another roll up above this one yep there's a couple back here that yes. squeeze through this chain that you see hanging uh, is a curtain chain it's to stop we have links break off of these and that stops the uh, chain from going further into the chipper it will stop it stops a lot of it uh, now you say you have to replace at least one of these every day you have to replace the chain every day not just one chain this like the, the whole the, all of them every other row now see. this one is shorter that means that you right. you keep going back one with this one is shorter and this is on the outside okay oh uh, but what they start out originally at eight links yeah on this particular machine when they get down to six links we generally throw them away because it doesn't they get six you throw them away because it isn't hitting the wood between four to six links it isn't hitting the wood hard enough to knock the bark off to create a to keep the bark okay down. Now you mentioned to take to change that you you take these you you're telling us to have this on screws with an allen wrench a big one yes and then you have a like a bolt with a rod on it uh -huh. a sliding hammer yeah hooks right on threads right into the end of this rod that these chains are hooked to and you can pull the rod out and then you just keep taking the chain out and then when you start back over you just keep putting new ones in and the, keep then you replace right. everyone every day yes uh or at least bring it up one 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 uh shorter now someone gets inside because they can't reach over there right, right inside yes how long of an operation? 10 minutes? 15? But, uh, 15 minutes to do this drum and about 20 minutes to do the top drum. Okay, that's what it's all about. Like all the chain. We talked about chains before. That's what we're talking about. Is this a problem other than replacing? Not, no. not a service problem in this area too much? Well, this drum here you change about between uh, 10 to 12 months. You have to change and throw them out. Put a new one in. Okay, they get down. worn out. Do you ever get anything fall in and get and get? Oh, yes, they get do. caught. You get caught. So you got to get. You got to stop the machine. You stop the machine. You have to shut it all, everything down. Then you go inside, cut it out with a chainsaw. Do you know why it does that? Is that because the way the wood uh, is a crooked piece of wood, a rotten piece, uh, a dead section in the tree? Okay. Uh, it doesn't happen very often, but it does. But happen. It, that can happen. Okay. Tim's going to show us uh, on the top here what the knives look like to do all this work. Hydraulic, no less. And these are the knives. You see, they run from the center out. Tell me whatever you'd like to tell me about it. There's three knives. Only three? There's three knives. We're making a 7 8 chip. Uh huh. Uh, as this wheel is being turned, the wood, the wheels that carry the wood through are timed so that as one knife passes by and makes a cut, they have rolled the tree ahead seven eighths of an inch by the time the next knife gets there. And it's only uh, three knives that do all that? Yes. You Replacing, sharpening, what do you do? How often okay, do you have to... We're going to replace them right now. Right now, huh? Right now. And that's all done, done with... Right there. We're going to replace on this particular machine, it has two sets, two, two knives, one on top of the other. Uh-huh. Because the top knife is generally the one that does most of the work. Oh, you mean it's a double, it's, it's something like that my... Uh, what is it? They, you know the uh, electric razors? They show you lift and yeah. cut twice? We yeah. have, uh, it measures 30 inches, and if you, uh, the top 15 inches generally gets dull. Yeah, because that's what's cutting mostly. Yeah, that's because your wood is smaller. Yeah, that's why it's hitting it first. So we can change this. Otherwise, if it was a solid knife, you'd have to, to resharpen a whole 30 inch piece of uh, steel every time. Well, is it logical to assume that you're doing it right now because this is a slack time and trucks aren't here? Yes, and also they do need to be done. And they need to be done. Yes. Otherwise you wouldn't see that up in the end. They, it would, is that well, very often? That, that happens. Happens once in a while uh, you too? You see the blackness on the knife. Uh -huh. uh, paper chip is very uh, critical on making a high quality product. It's not like making uh, energy chips. Yep. That's right. There are uh, two kinds of chips. One you would burn to, for a furnace to make energy, and the other one is to make paper. Yes. And that's what they want. And so you want long fibers, as much long as possible. Well, yeah, not, what are they, not seven, seven eighths of an inch? Seven eighths of an inch. Uh, that, I believe Pat was showing you what a quality chip looked like. Yes. And uh, 
one thing about chips, the longer the fibers, the stronger your paper is, you know. And also, uh, well, that's another, we'll do that at a paper mill sometime. I'll explain you how to make the paper and, 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 and how they go different ways and for the strength. But, okay, uh, is there anything else we can, you can show us on this machine we should know? Basically, uh, no? Basically, that, this smaller engine, which is a Caterpillar 325, uh, that machine, that motor runs just the flail. That's all it operates. Okay, just the, where the chains are. That yes. One. And this one runs the chipper. Yes, this is an 800 uh, horse Caterpillar. And what runs the hydraulic off this, off Big, this motor? Yes. Huge. Great, great. Well, Tim, you live also in Messina? Yes. Just outside or yes. Messina? How many children in your family? Three. Three. Boys? Two girls. And a boy? Uh, and a boy. Listen, but all these boys, you guys are all having girls now? Yes. Uh, so you got, how old is your son? My son is seven. He my can't be here yet, huh? My oldest daughter is 19, and my youngest daughter is 17. Well, now I'm going to ask you about this equal employment. I haven't seen any women working on this job. Do they want to work here, you think? Huh? No. <laughs> <laughs> kind of tough, eh? It would be kind you of You don't hard. see many women in the woods, I guess, but it's a, it's a tough job here. Not that they can't do tough work, but... Uh, and you say most of these people can, can do the repairs on the, they all know the machines pretty well. Oh, yes. You keep a lot of spare parts? A lot. What, what for instance, chain, well, obviously. Well, chain is something that constantly wears out. But on these chippers, you could have a clutch go bad. You have those on hand? On hand. What, how much do you have to pay for a clutch, you know? 10000 What? 10000 for a clutch? You have one on hand? The main clutch. But what's happened in the past, we've had a clutch go bad, and we've had to lose three or four days waiting for one. The name of the game, right? And yeah. there's all kinds of things you have to carry, and spare pumps and You motors. keep those at home, though, right? They're not here. You keep it well, in another location? Material that you know you're not going to need every day will stay at home. But parts that can fail, they're in the, the Carry your truck shack you. here or on the trailer on the other yeah. job. Okay. Well, listen, gentlemen, I don't know what else we can cover. Well, a couple of things. Yeah, come over here, Tim, with both of you here. You certainly don't have enough wood to work on. You're always looking for more wood lots. That's right. People. Now, what, tell us about what you're looking for, the kind of wood, the size of the lot, the stand, and, and how they would go about contacting you if they were interested. There's a lot of woodlocks that watch our program. Yeah, basically, what we're looking for, our, our market is mainly hardwood. But there is times when we can market uh, the softwood. But we're always looking for hardwood logs, softwood logs, and definitely a, a large volume of hardwood fiber, which would, would be made into chips. And as far as size of the, the job, as long as the quality is there and the quantity, we will the, the size doesn't matter that much. You know, 50 acres and over is, is really what we're looking for. When you say logs, you don't mean logs. You, you want to you want to cut it yourself. You don't That's want right. anybody to bring you logs. No, no, we're no, looking no. at this time. Okay, for what stumpage, stumpage on the stump, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay, and what kind of trees? Any particular one? Just any hard? Hardwood mainly, and there is times when we can market the softwood. Tell the people what's a hardwood and a softwood tree. How do you well, tell? Well, the way I look at it, anything that bears leaves is considered to be a hardwood. Needles is softwood. Don't go by the density. That's exactly what I've learned. Exactly. That's exactly what I've word, or learned right there. If, it, if it's got leaves, you got hardwood, no matter what it is. Huh? The soft maple or anything else is hardwood. You were in construction before you came back into uh, wood. Is that what you told me? Oh, that was that was Lee. Lee was. Uh, Lee was. Okay, yeah. that was it. So, do you people have different functions with the company? You mostly do the same thing. Or? Different thing. Are you more or less at that end of it, and he's more or less in in this area? Or what? How well, do you? Tim is normally on the job. What's that mean? He's he's on the job. And you're not here? No, I'm not here that much. He don't come to work. Is that what you're telling me? <laughs> no, not very often. Where does he go, Tim? <laughs> What's he do? He goes out looking for more oh, it things sets to up do. A lot of jobs. And... You're the setup man, huh? Well, try to be sometimes. <laughs> okay. There's there's been the odd time when. They show up on the job and everybody looks at me like, we're not going there. <laughs> well, listen, we certainly appreciate the time, all the effort you put in and your being here for the last four hours with us as you took us through and all your people who are very courteous to us. And I, I think we've learned, I hope you people have learned an awful lot about what you've seen. And if you haven't learned enough, you can read about some of it. You can talk to uh, 
some people talked and we want to thank very much of course Leonard Drown who owns this land who brought it to the attention of Calvin that something was going on back here with over how many dollars did we say uh, between the between the two sites we have over five million in equipment. five million dollars in equipment uh, we were we've been talking about farmers with all the equipment but uh, here it's all the whole story is the experience of your people your people and your equipment that's all you've that's got right. right that's it and if if we had the had the money, I don't think we'd have the equipment. <laughs> if you had the money, would you buy the equipment? That's would you? Right. You wouldn't, huh? We wouldn't. You wouldn't start over on it. Huh? <laughs> Is it hard to get out now? Well, we have different people tell us we'll never get out, but we hope like hell that they're wrong. Okay, well, we're prove them wrong. Suppose that the January first, nineteen ninety-six, you decide we had enough of this. Is there a market to sell a whole uh, a whole thing like this? Probably not in this area. Because you're the only one in northern New York that's got this kind of yes. equipment. There's there's a lot of other contractors that have, you know, quite a lot of equipment, but they're not set up the way we are. Okay. And the, the biggest problem, it all comes down to marketing. Well, you better make sure you tell your people up there that when I gave those figures, that we're not going to be out of a job, guys. They don't want to sell. You're still going to have a job. I just was wondering, you know, you know, like big farms, you know, like the Castine farm, three and four million dollars. Who goes and buys a three or four million dollar farm today? You know, it just isn't fast turnover. That's right. But your equipment's very saleable individually to other people. If that it is, happens. but there's there's times of the year. I mean, we tried to to sell off some equipment, some used stuff, of, you know, two years ago when the industry was really flat, and we ended up running it longer because the value of used equipment was wasn't there. And I mean, right now it's not too bad, but it, the way the market it moves up and down, you know, mm -hmm. we expect within a couple of years for the market to go completely the other way again. He was mentioning when we were off camera that one of his big philosophies, and I assume the, the brothers too, is that you don't fool around with old equipment, you don't uh, repair or would get beyond a certain point, you don't buy used, you buy new, and keep it going all the time. Yes. Correct? Downtown. Is, Downtown. is it hard for three or four brothers to agree on some of these things? Well, not really. Not really. We, we all know what we have to do, know what it takes. And when we first got started, we had the, the oldest, the worst equipment you ever can imagine. So we know what it's like to try to make it on the other end. You could always bring your dad in. He could settle the arguments like he used to. <laughs> or the real boss. Who's the real boss? Well, you just said it. But your your what? mother. <laughs> <laughs> the real boss is the mother. What did she do with eight boys in the house? What do you do as a, as a female with nine boys, counting the father? Well... Like I told you earlier, we used to think she was awful mean until we had our own family, but now we know. You know what it's all about, huh? Yes. Watch out for the train, you leave the house, don't drive too fast, right? Right. And don't fall asleep at the wheel. <laughs> Again, we want to thank Tim and uh, Pat Curran. We're sorry we didn't meet Lee, but uh, tell him we, we, we'd like to have met him. We, we've mentioned his name several times, and uh, we hope you've enjoyed this tour. We'll, unlike uh, Pat, sometimes we stop for different reasons with our camera, and we're back again. And one of the things I wanted to ask you is, when international, say, as a unit, cuts wood, they always talk about they cut two and they plant one or something like that. You don't replant at all no, yourself? No, we don't. Okay. Well, when you cut selected things out in the woods, they will come back naturally? Yes, they will. And when you're doing a selective cut, what you're actually doing is releasing the stand that you're leaving. And that stand will get bigger, of course, faster than if the stand was growing by itself and probably within the next 15 to 20 years you'd have a, a cut again. Again, then you'd be selective again and then yes. you'd be, and the new ones would be coming up, those are the ones you'd leave? That's right. Okay. All right. Uh, does environmental get in, get involved with you very much? Yes, they're they're looking all the time on, on what we're doing along with other loggers mm -hmm. and uh, the main thing is, is you know, water quality is, is uh, a big concern along with uh, just the type of job you're doing the yeah. aesthetics of your job when it's done i don't know oh. if we did it on camera but except for being five miles from your home where would be the next best place you'd like to get some wood how far do you go from your house to well work? we'll we'll normally try to work within 60 to 70 miles but if the wood is right in the time of the year we have went 110 120 miles yeah. home every night too Tim? every night huh 
So you don't come to the job every day? No, I don't. Ah, so he don't care how far it is really, right? You get 120, <laughs> he's going to say, well, we had to do it. No, I'll tell you, I really care. <laughs> you care? Yes, because All right. <laughs> there's times when you go too far economically, you're just making work. Okay. I don't know if you know me as well as some of the people out there. I, I say some things many times that I'm not, I keep saying with a real straight face, but I, I don't mean it. I know what you're saying. And I, again, thank you very much for your time. I've learned an awful lot myself, but probably as much as I've learned in the last 50 interviews that we have done, because I've never have seen anything like this. I know a little bit about wood, a little bit about paper, but I've never seen this part of the operation. And I was amazed and I was very, very appreciative. Very good. Hometown Cable, what's going on here, Bob Venn? With the mic, Calvin cast on with the camera. We've been talking with Pat and Tim Curran. They, op they own this operation with their brother Lee, and they've been in it since about, I think you said 10 years or more? Plus? 10 years since we formed the company. The company in about five years with this new operation yes. with the shipping and so forth. But as far as actually being in the in the woods, we've had been sending wood to the mills since I was 17. So. Since he was 17. You figure that one out. And he's looking for an easier way to do it all the time, right, yes, Tim? Yes. And he hasn't done much. You're the one doing all the work out here, right? <laughs> oh, and these guys up don't, here. Don't say that. Don't say that? <laughs> oh, okay, you have to answer to him later. No, no, we all do equal. <laughs> oh, he's very, very, oh, you are such a great brother. <laughs> We're talking with Tim and Pat. Thanks very much, guys. And continue to watch Hometown Cable every day, folks. And don't forget, if you're not already a patron, $12 or more once a year to Hometown Cable to keep this kind of program because uh, unlike these guys who go to the bank, uh, Calvin needs a few dollars to buy the tapes and equipment then there's always a lot of things to buy we're on short batteries today we're out here where it can't be charged up and uh, hope you've uh, thank you for putting up with us on that and we'll see you next sunday if you got any comments please make them known